All right, bye. Hello, my name is Anne, and just making sure everybody can hear me today. Um, I'm Anne Burke. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a librarian at the North Carolina State University Libraries. And today we're going to be doing a little sewing together. So what are we going to sew? Um, Colin says, we can hear you. Awesome. Glad, glad everything's coming through. So today we're going to um, work on sewing a, a throw pillow cover. So a few, um, a number of years ago, I purchased, I had these pillow forms, like just, you know, down, down pillows. And I, I bought these pillow covers for them. And you can't really, this one isn't nearly as bad as the other one, but they are, um, they've gotten very shabby and I'm kind of tired of them. So I thought, well, maybe I'll make new ones. How difficult, how difficult can it really be? And it turns out like not that difficult. Um, the also really cool thing is even though, even though these pillow covers, um, were not expensive, maybe they were $15 each. Um, the, uh, you can make them so much cheaper if, if you make them yourself. So I went out and I bought some fabric. Um, it looks like, well, here's my, here's my example. So it's a uh, fun, kind of fun in an old lady kind of way. It's got strawberries and flowers and birds. And anyway, um, I found it on sale uh, for, it's an upholstery fabric, $15, $15 a yard. Um, so with that, I could make two pillowcases for $15. Um, which is half the price of the ones I, of I, that I bought and much, much better quality fabric. Whatever I had, they had used for these other pillowcases, it just kind of pills and doesn't do nicely. So, and anyway, the zipper was sticking now. I am not a great sewer. I'm still learning. I've maybe been sewing like a year and a half. Um, so I had at first thought about doing zippers and I was like, oh, I'm not at zippers yet. Um, maybe next year I'll, I'll do zippers. So uh, I'm going to take this pillow form out of the old pillowcase and throw that one out. And so here we have this. So materials we're going to need for today's, um, for today's craft, I guess. Um, you have your, your pillow insert. So I'm going to put that here. Pair of scissors. Um, I recommend getting a nice pair of fabric scissors and then hiding it from everybody in your house because uh, they um, they will kind of dull and become not useful if people start using them for cutting paper, chicken bones, pipe cleaners. So buy yourself a nice pair of fabric scissors or really any scissors and then protect them. Um, I've got pins, lots of pins. Um, obviously I have my fabric, there's that, and I have a, um, this is not necessary, but this is a fabric marking pen. Um, it, you can write on fabric with it and then, um, when you iron it, the ink disappears. So it helps you mark off what you were going to be doing and then, um, hide any evidence that you ever marked. I have um, thread, a pretty neutral color. Um, this is this is honestly a much lighter weight thread than I normally would use with upholstery fabric. But anyway, it'll do. It did the first one just fine. So that is my thread, and it'll blend nicely into the color of my fabric. And also, bear with me here, a ruler. So this is a nice ruler. It's you, you can see through it. Um, it has plenty of markings. And while some rulers are anti-slip, um, this one isn't. So you can see I had attached. You can get these like little um, sticky sticky dots. Um, so they're just a little bit tacky. And you um, 
and that they'll kind of not they'll keep the ruler from sliding around on your fabric as you go along so um you might have pillows at home and your pillows probably aren't my pillow size um, so the thing you want to do is measure your pillow um, so i'm going to do this for for illustration's sake but i already know this is a 20 inch pillow um, so here we go start it wait that one two actually it's kind of if i stretch it it's 20 but it's like kind of 19. so your pillow um you know puffs up so actually from end to end it's like looks more like 15 inches um, but if you squash it out and flatten it, it's more like 19. um so what i did for the first one because as you're sewing you will have a seam allowance I cut a 20 by 20 square of for my front fabric, um, which we'll do now. And then we'll have about a half inch seam on either side, which will make the exterior of the pillow closer to 19 inches. Um, if you make it smaller, the pillow will still fit in because it can kind of squish up. You'll just have like a poofier, puffier pillow. So the nice thing about this particular project is that there's a lot of forgiveness because the pillow is flexible so we're going to take our fabric here and start measuring it out last time i did one of these twitch streams i pre-measured everything and the project went very smoothly because of that but i didn't get around to it this time so if you have a really busy pattern with a lot of things going on you know you might want to um you might want to pick an area that you want centered and featured on your pillow like maybe you quite like the strawberries you might you might cut your fabric to make sure the strawberries were dead center in the pillow that tends to be fairly wasteful of fabric so i'm not going to do that and i kind of like all bits of this fabric so i don't mind what's kind of featured or centered um you can also use like so many different things. Um, you know, I happen to buy this fabric, but I, this, uh, over the weekend, I went to a, a thrift store. Um, I was donating some clothes and after I was there, I was browsing around and they had, they had shower curtains, like, and, and curtains, like a rack of shower curtains and curtains. And they had one shower curtain that had like a really funky, modern geometric pattern on it it was like one of those kind of not like a not a nylon shower curtain but you know like a heavyweight cotton and you you know you'd have a, a liner inside of it and i almost bought that to um upcycle it as pillows but i already had this and honestly i'm running out of room for textiles in my house so i i resisted but if anyone is interested it might still be there this was the cause for pause thrift store on North Market Drive in Raleigh. So, and while you're there, you can see the cats. Um, I went there with my kids and I, I had kind of forgotten that, I mean, I knew that cause for pause, their profits go to um, animal charities. Um, but I forgot that they also do adoptions. And so there was, there were several um, like, cat towers and cages and one had about five or six teeny tiny kittens they were so cute collins put a link to cause for pause there i really i really like that thrift shop and there's also one um there's the one on north market drive and then there's one on i think south saunders street heading south out of raleigh as you head down towards garner I don't think they have the animals in their store though. I haven't seen them there before. So I am just measuring out to 20 inches here and I'm gonna put a little line right there. And what I've done on this end, ooh, you can't see. What I've done on this end is I'm using, I like this, this big chunky ruler because it allows me to start drawing my 90 degree angle. I'll just use the short end of this to make sure I'm getting a square 
going. So I'm going to then take that and rotate it and measure out another 20 inches. This is, um, I noticed this after I bought this fabric, which is not ideal. On the, on the selvage edge, it says dry cleaning recommended. That is never going to happen. I'll just hand wash and hope for the best. The one I already made, I, I saw the dog laying his head on it and I was like, oh, I'm not sure a creamy colored pillow is the best idea given, given what I know about the creatures who inhabit my house. So I'm just, I'm just marking off, um, another 20 inches. And I've, I've also, if you can see here, I've, I've drawn the 90 degree angle. So I'm going to keep, keep marking until I get my square. This, this fabric I bought, since I'm talking about my grubby dog, um, it's, it's a complimentary fabric, part of a collection to the, um, to the dog crate cover in the back. The, the whole purpose of this was actually um, that this project started with the dog crate. Um, my dog has out, outgrew his puppy crate and then I had to get a bigger crate and then I needed a new crate cover. So I got the fabric for that and I was like, oh, but it's right next to the couch. So matching pillows would be fun. That is the dog behind me. Can you see? Whoops. He's sleeping. Let's, let's hope it stays that way. I like understand fully the, the phrase, let sleeping dogs lie. Don't, don't wake it up. Cause if I wake him up, he will be hungry the world's hungriest dog acts like he's always starving um, and I'm just gonna do the fourth edge here and it's it's nice just to confirm that like my angles didn't go weird along the way um, that when I when I measure out the the last side that it actually happens to line up to 20 inches exactly so um, I got all the sides right length all the angles right angles and now I'm going to start cutting cutting out my the front of my pillow with my scissors um, if I had kind of more space and more flexibility I'd use my mat and my rotary cutter um, I love this rotary cutter so you can just, um, you know, press it down and just run it along, but I've, I've got too many things going on on the desk right now, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to use my fabric scissors. Snip, snip, snip. Nice square, square. Um... I started, I started sewing like a year and a half ago to help a colleague out with a workshop and I was like, oh, that was fun. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll sew a quilt. Um, and then I, so I like bought, I bought like a, a pr like a qu quilt kit and like it just, I mean, it, it came with the fabric and the pattern and then like there were a bunch of YouTube videos you could follow along. Um, but you had to do all the measuring and the cutting and everything, which was, I thought like a fun way to get started. Like I knew what it was supposed to look like in the end. And there was a video f of someone explaining each step along the way. Um, and I did all of that one cutting, cutting the pieces out with scissors. Cause I hadn't gotten my rotary cutter yet. And it turns out like that was the most accurate of all the quilts I've ever made. So I do think 
it's slower and more time consuming, but I find my cuts are more accurate when I use scissors as opposed to the rotary cutter. The rotary cutter is kind of convenient because you can stack up, especially if you're cutting out multiple pieces of the same size and shape, you can stack the fabric up on each other and cut, you know, three, four layers at once. Um, but the fabric inevitably shifts beneath, you know, just a little bit. Imagine like you're using, you know, you use like a paper cutter at school and, um, you know, when you stack 10, 10 pieces of paper, inevitably there's some slide and slip and wiggle and they're never, they're never all the same. And I find the same happens with the rotary cutter when I'm stacking things up. So I'm starting to cut this out. It's honestly, watching some, the, when you watch YouTube videos of people sewing, it's really great because they just speed up all the boring parts. Um, you know, they're like magic and everything got cut. Um, the, we're not speeding this up. You're seeing it in all its slow drudgery. But here we go. I'm wearing headphones, so you can't probably hear the, the squish squish of the scissors. There's something kind of satisfying as it goes through the weave. You know, I might go back and get that shower curtain. Who knows? Yeah, it, it, it is kind of ASMR. You could just like listen to someone snip, snip through fabric. So we're going to get this front cut out and then I'll show you the, I'll show you my example pillow um, to show you the, the style of pillow we're making because I'm not quite ready to tackle zippers. Um, we're doing what's called an envelope pillow. So the front is one full piece and then the back opens like an envelope. And so the back will be two pieces joining to the back. Um, because the front is 20 inches across, the back will, will have to cut um, two pieces that are more than 10 inches each. Um, for this example, I think I made them 13 and a half and they're just honestly, like I, I eyeballed it. They could have been slightly larger. So I think I'm going to make the, this next one, maybe 14 to 220 by how do I decide the overlap? Um, I, I didn't. It, I eyeballed it. Um, this will be fine whenever I figure out how to do buttons. That'll be next. I was going to try to do buttons for this, but I was telling Colin earlier, um, I'm, I'm not quite getting the hang of the, of the button foot. There's, if you have a sewing machine and like me, you wondered, what's this thing? Like, I thought it was like, I had no idea what it, what it was but then I learned this is a special presser foot that you put on your sewing machine and it can help you sew buttonholes and the most fun thing about it is that to decide how big the buttonhole is you get your button and you stick it in here and then that guides the the buttonhole um that like how long it sews the buttonhole based on the button that you place in it. So anyway, I had a little, I had a little difficulty with that earlier. I have a few examples somewhere, but can't find them. All right. So anyway, that was my front we've cut out. Now we're going to do the back and then you always wind up with these little scraps of fabric. So, um, it's always great to have a wastebasket nearby. And I saw a, a trick. Um, I thought I had it around. Someone must have wandered off with it. The, you, you wind up with a lot of little fabric scraps, but also like a lot of little threads hanging off of you and like all over your workspace. So it's sometimes useful to have like um, a clothing lint roller and you just roll it all over yourself and 
and your your workspace and it just picks up all those little little tiny stray threads here was the example button holes I did actually didn't turn out too badly but anyway um, not well enough that I'm willing to experiment right here with an audience of Colin and whoever else <laughs> so all right well I've okay here's my 20 by 20 now I'm gonna go for 20 by 14 This is unrelated, but recently we were doing, putting up some crown molding in our dining room. And my husband is not American um, and was growing increasingly frustrated with um, our tape measure. And he's like, you're trying to read, you know, quarter inches, one eighth inches. And he's like, why, why? aren't we using centimeter tape measures? And I was like, that's a really interesting question. I've like, I haven't seen a centimeter, like a metric tape measure in this country anyway, but I was able to Amazon one. So, so now I'm, I'm the proud owner of a metric tape measure. It really actually would have made doing the crown molding a lot easier. All right, so I didn't have enough width in my in my previous piece to do 14, so I just cut off the the excess, and I'm going to start measuring fresh. And Collins, yep, there's a a metric tape measure. I got mine on Amazon too. Using my fabric pen, I'm going to try to go a little bit faster on this one because this really is probably like watching paint dry. So I hear it's going to rain today. And then, I don't know, in Raleigh, I, I saw the forecast something like 28 degrees later this week. And I thought that is uncalled for in April. I'm pretty worried about my my vegetables. I think I've officially become an old lady just by saying that. Okay, so 14 inches, gonna measure that out. I've just drawn one kind of straight line and I'm gonna, um, yep, Colin also, your plants. I, th I think I, I've got some tomatoes that I planted prematurely. I don't think they're going to... I mean, they barely survived the last frost. I think this one might do them in. Snap peas, on the other hand. Yes, the beans. You put corn in. I've never done corn. I, I don't think we have quite enough space. Yeah, tw oh, 29 tomorrow night. Beans, I think the beans will survive. Sugar snap peas, they're a lot of fun. It's like, I mean, it's just like a, like a snap, a snack on a, on a string. They just kind of grow up and you can walk out there and grab them. I was talking to a colleague this week who planted some sunflower seeds and only afterwards noticed that these sunflowers grow to be 14 feet tall. It's like that. Like I had to think about what 14 feet actually is. And I was looking at my, the room I'm in, I'm like, well, I have eight foot ceilings. So that sunflower goes right up through my ceiling and then another six feet. That's crazy. It's just a massive, massive flower. Right? They're called um, American Giant. So if the corn doesn't work out, 
try American Giant Sunflowers. Soon we're going to get to the fun part. We're going to actually sow this. I promise. Recently, and this is unrelated, maybe someone can do a Twitch stream about this. Um, recently, I took my sewing machine, well, not really took it apart, but I like I took off all the, the plastic housing to clean it out and oil it, and it was so much fun. I didn't realize how much fluff and lint collects inside um, the the sewing machine but if you think about it I mean you've got that needle like going up and down and up and down and up and down and of course like it loses thread but also fluff from the fibers of the fabric you're sewing it was very very satisfying like micro cleaning experiment um, and then yeah you get it like a, a sewing machine oil and you Oil it up. And I don't think I'm imagining it. I think it, like, I noticed a difference in how how the machine sounded after I ran it after that. It was, it sounded a lot less clackety. Oh, no kidding. Andrew from the library? I'd love to watch that. How old of a sewing machine is he working with? Like proper antique or like nice. I felt very much like my, my kids really like to watch this show, the repair shop. It's on Netflix. It's, 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 it has the the vibe of like the Great British Bake Off kind of. It's it's a British show, and um, it's like a bunch of people fixing things. My fabric pen has run out, so I'm gonna reach behind me and grab another one. Fortunately, like when I bought these, like in the way that Amazon sells things, um, like it was it was the same price to buy fifty as it was to buy seven. So now I have 50 fabric pens, which is good because they run out the ink. It, they use up ink a lot faster than normal pens. Um, but yeah, the repair shop, they have like, they have this little kind of thatched barn and people bring them all sorts of broken things from like old clocks to ceramics to like a they did a butter churn or some old chairs and they have woodworking people and upholsters and ceramics experts and they just fix things. It's a, it's adorable and so pleasant and so satisfying if that's your kind of thing. But it definitely made me feel like, okay, I could, I could, open my sewing machine and put it back together. And I think I could make sure it kept working. And it did. Collins just put the, the link to the stream of repairing an old sewing machine. I'm gonna definitely watch that one later. It's like, I mean, there are so many moving parts. It's it's not. I mean, I'm sure it's not quite as complicated as a watch, but like there are there are really um, a lot of yeah important pieces that have to work together in order to make sure the needle comes down at the right time for the bobbin to grab the thread and bring it back up. So there's like a little, there's a little timing device down in there under the bobbin. 
Collins dropped the link to the repair shop in. Lord, this cutting stuff is dull. Ooh, really? Sewing machines more complicated than a 3D printer. You know, I could probably see that. Even though if you explained that to, like, my grandfather, he would... Well, first of all, he wouldn't... My, my, my grandfather was born in 1898, I think. He's not alive anymore. But um, had you told him, honestly, like if you told him there was a printer, like much less a 3D printer, he would have just not believed you. My, my family has absurdly long familial generations and so it seems like everybody has kids when they're like almost 40 and so you get like three generations spanning over a century it's crazy where I'm almost done here. Yeah, then we get to the next most exciting part of this, which is ironing. Um, another important tool in your in your arsenal is your iron. Um, you can you can get along without it, and I I know, um, but it does make things go a little bit more smoothly. And also, because I think I will put buttons in this one eventually, I'm going to iron in um, some interfacing, at least on one of the flaps, maybe both of the flaps, just to, so interfacing is kind of a, a stiffer and a stabilizing um, material. Um, it's, it's often got like a a glue side so when you iron it the glue melts and it adheres to your fabric certain fabrics and this is it, they're just very flexible and as they're going through the sewing machine they want to they want to bunch and slip and slide and the feed dogs don't push them through at an even rate so if you put a stabilizing material like an interfacing in there um, it'll just keep things a little more firm. How do you pick a sewing a good sewing machine? Uh, I mean, there are you can you can spend real money on a sewing machine. I mean, not a sewing machine. On a, you can spend real money on an iron. Um, I have a pretty cheap one for for my purposes here. There are things that like I was like I had I had accidentally bought like the cheapest of irons um, and I realized it didn't have a steam button and I was like ah okay so um, at the at the least you want the ability to do a steam press in addition to like water squirting um, like the 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 plate like the hot bit of it I think some of them are treated to be kind of glidier and slipperier and they'll move across your fabric um, more nicely. Uh, I, I don't have one of those. And then there are also, you know, if you, if you want to get really specific, there are, I do have, and I don't use it, okay? But I have this tiny little iron um, and it, it can iron like little seams. It takes so long to heat up and I, I don't like it, so I don't use it. I have just this sunbeam. The thing I really like about it, it, it has a retractable cord, right? Um, so uh, I don't, like, cords all around the place kind of bug me. The cord is already out. So um, I like that. But other than that, it was the cheapest iron I could find. So I'll let that heat up. 
And I also have, this is completely unnecessary, but I like it. I have a very, um, a tabletop ironing board. And very often I don't even, um, I don't even flip it out. I just keep it right here and I can get by with just like half of it. So, um, so here is my part of my back piece. And now I'm going to start ironing because the flaps, the flaps to this um, are slightly finished, right? Uh, they're folded over. So I'm going to iron over the folds. So first I'm going to do like a little, oh, you want to see something fun? All right, you see these, see my pen marks here? All right, I'm going to make them disappear. Just like that, gone. Um, like a hem without any stitching. Yes, I'm going, I, I am eventually going to stitch it, but I'm going to iron it in place so that when I'm, um, when I am ultimately stitching it, it'll, uh, I don't have to worry about like keeping it pinned or like kind of trying to make sure that it's staying even as I bring it through. So oh, no, who, who knows about fabric? I mean, like it's not the kind of thing that you're born knowing. Um, and you certainly learn by playing with it. So I've, I'm going to, so, um, iron over about a quarter inch and then fold that once more, probably one more inch. And next I'm going to iron in the stabilizer into this part, but I'm going to get this folded over. So I know who knows about fabric. Okay. Yeah. There are some people who maybe run an entire college who know about fabric. It's true. There is, there's a surprising amount to know. It's just, just amazing how, how like almost all of us wear fabric every day and they don't even really think much about it. So this is, um, this is actually probably like not the most ideal interfacing for this. It's really thin. There are different weights of, of interfacing and you can't, you can't really see it. Um, this side is slippery smooth and this side is bumpy and basically it's been sprayed with a fine mist of glue and when I iron it that glue is going to melt and it's going to stick to the inside so I'm just going to kind of cut this out pretty roughly nobody's going to see it it's going to be on the inside but it's going to add a little extra um, support for when I am eventually brave enough to try to sew buttonholes into this thing. So sorry, we're going to see this whole process and not see the exciting outcome. Who knows, like maybe, maybe in a few weeks, I'll just do a really short twit stream once I've figured out, figured out the buttons. So interfacing, um, it is, it is the, I guess it is interfacing between two pieces of fabric. Um, and like if you ever, um, and you know, um, I'm going to repeat, I'm definitely not an expert, but like if you've ever worn a shirt, you know, a button down shirt and you've noticed like the collar is stiffer than the rest of the shirt or the um, placard where the buttons are are stiffer than the rest of the fabric it's it's not just doubled up layers of the fabric um, but it is it is something that they've stitched between the layers of the fabric to provide stiffness and dimension so um like i think You'll probably see it on 
no, actually it's, yeah, I guess this is kind of like when you see um, embroidery on a, on a thing, they'll have a, a thing that the embroidery catches onto. That's, I, I don't know if it's technically interfacing, but you'll see it on garments all the time. Once you know, once you know what it is, you'll realize it's, it's everywhere. So I'm just going to iron this, iron this in. I think I'm, I'm only going to do it on one side because this is boring. And really, I only need it on the side where the button holes are going to go. So I'm going to fold it over and it's all going to glue together. Nicely. There are other, um, I, I recently bought like an iron on tape. And you can like you can do hems just by ironing basically something like this, like a, a heat a heat reactive tape, and it can do like a no sew hem. If you're ever like adjusting curtains or doing something like this. All right. So I have that hem of a sort right there. I'm going to do throw my interfacing. Oh, look, see you got you just wind up with things stuck all over you. Do the next one. This one will be a lot faster because I'm not going to bother with the interfacing. And the reason you don't just here, I'm going to show you the reason I do the quarter turn fold um, before I do the second fold is I mean, from the outside, you would never notice the difference. But if I just fold it like this and stitch it down, what I'm left with is a raw edge here. And after wear and tear and use and washing, this raw edge will fray, right? So um, you fold it in once so that raw edge is hidden, protected, and you're not going to deal with all that fraying fabric over the life of your... Um, your pillow case or anything else it's um generally a good idea when you're th i did not do it with this because this is recommended dry clean fabric so but when you're sewing other things and you're using normal cotton it's a really good idea to to wash and dry the fabric before you start sewing with it because you want like you want any shrinkage that's going to happen to happen before you cut at, before you measure and cut and sew. I recently I sewed some placemats for for Easter dinner and I was really excited about this fabric it has bunnies all over it but like it's not too not too cheesy. Um so anyway, but I I was in a time crunch so I bought I bought bias tape which is um i'll show you what bias tape is we're not using it in this but this is bias tape and it's like something that you might use to finish off an edge on something so it's uh you can get single fold or double fold bias tape and so if you have a raw edge you can stitch this on um but i didn't i didn't think about this the bias tape was not pre-washed and dried so when I washed and dried one single placemat, I was like, oh, Lord, the bias tape shrunk. But my placemat had already been pre-washed. That was sad. So I'm just going to be really careful. Okay, so now, oh, this is the fun part. We're getting to the sewing machine. Let's start clearing off the space. I think I... I unplugged my sewing machine, but not my iron. Here we go. All right. So remember the button foot, I'm not using that. But I had been playing around with it. So I have to put my normal foot back on. This is a presser foot. Um, let me just line. Sorry, the camera angle up so you can see. Here we go. Okay. So there's a little there's a little lever at the back here you can raise and get 
that presser foot on. Uh, sewing machines have a little light that comes on, help you see what you're doing. Some lights are better than others. This one's not great. And then as you're threading your machine, it, um, there's usually like a guide here. You know, you loop it around the top first, then through this thing that adjusts tension and you bring it around here. This is like, the, there's a word for this, the arm that runs up and down. Go down here, loop it around here. And then this sewing machine has a, uh, does have an automatic needle threader. I have never found it to be any easier than trying to eyeball it. I, I have this little pair of scissors, which I think it, it, I love um, just for like cutting the ends of threads off. And it fits, it fits right in this little box right here. You can just hide it away there. It took me, I, I like didn't even know that that box flipped out until like after a few weeks of using this, I was like, what is this? Oh, there's a, there's a whole like little kit of supplies in there. All right. So I am going to start sewing the edges down just to make it, I mean, you could, you could technically get away with just doing one stitch. But I'm going to do, I'm going to do two at my quarter inch fold and one out towards the edge. So this could get noisy. Um, oh, no, I was doing something else earlier. So I had fiddled with my tension. Um, t tension, I'm, I like understand tension only slightly more than I understand the settings on like a DSLR camera. Um, but my understanding of sewing machine tension is that it is like, it, it determines how much the top thread and how much the bottom thread pull against each other. So that if you, um, if your tension is all wrong, you could actually kind of wind up with like on one side, a pretty straight line of thread and then from the other end all that thread is doing the work coming through and looping around i didn't explain that very well at all um but just understand that like yes tension problems can be big problems in sewing um so i've sewn forward a few stitches and now i'm going to sew backwards just a couple of stitches like two or three um that just kind of helps strengthen the, the stitch lines that, so that things don't unravel on you. And then I'll just keep going. And then I'm gonna get to the end and I'm gonna back stitch again. Of different machines backstitch different ways, but in order to backstitch here, I push down this lever, it says reverse, and then I'm done um, with that line. Now I could cut this thread off, but since I'm running down again, I'm not going to bother. It saves thread, um, it, actually over time, a decent amount of thread if you can manage to, um, in some like they might, you might call this chain piecing, especially if you were sewing multiple pieces together. You, um, cause if you cut your, if you cut your thread too short, the next time this lever arm runs up, it'll pull your thread back through your needle eye. So you need to leave the tail either a little bit long or manage not to cut it at all. Some people keep like a, just a little scrap piece of fabric to run through just two or three stitches. Um, before they bring on the next piece. I can show you that in just a second. This won't win any awards for the straightest sewing lines, but fortunately this color thread is a really good match to 
my fabric, so I'm not so worried about how visible my lines will be. So if you have just like a, an, um, yeah, if you have just a scrap piece, what you can do is lift that there. Now you've kind of locked your thread in a little bit, so you're not going to lose it. You can sever the piece you were cutting, and you won't lose your thread going back through. I'm just going to cut off the ends here. And I'm going to do one more line. One of them done? What's the wheel I'm turning? Um, so I was adjusting my needle position um, depending on how, where I wanted the, my stitch to go. But also um, this I don't think is probably the case on everybody's sewing machine, but um, there is a stitch width button which plays in with my needle position button. Um, so usually you would use your stitch width button um, if you were doing a zigzag stitch, if you wanted a very wide zigzag or a narrow zigzag, but it also affects your needle position. So I was, I was wondering why my needle wasn't jumping and I realized it was because I had been, um, earlier in the day I had been doing a zigzag stitch on something. Um, this is going to be, this is my piece with the interfacing. It's going to be um, it's going to be tougher for my machine to go through it. I think it'll, it won't have any trouble. Um, but if you do have like difficulty sewing through, um, thicker pieces of fabric, um, there are things to try different needle thicknesses. Um, if your needle isn't sharp, um, that could be a problem. It won't punch through the fabric very well. If you're doing something that's really, really bulky, um, I'll show this this in a second. But your the the reason your your fabric moves through is that there are things called feed dogs underneath, and they're basically little teeth that move and grab. They just grab the fabric and pull it along. But if you're dealing with something really, really bulky or fabric that shifts pretty easily then the feed dog will grab the bottom of the fabric but not the top so there's a special kind of um, foot it's called a walking foot that has feed dogs on the top um, so down here it's kind of hard to see but down here underneath there are these little teeth that go up and down and up and down and they're they just move your fabric forward um, and there is, um, there's a little button on the back of my machine and on most machines, you can actually retract the feed dogs all together. There will be some, some kinds of sewing. Like if you want to do free motion quilting, where you see like someone moves the fabric around in a fluid pattern underneath the, the moving needle, um, you definitely don't want the feed dogs in action at that for that so you can you can you can retract them um and then if you're me the next time you come to your machine you forget that you retracted the feed dogs and you wonder why your fabric isn't moving and why you're just stitching in one place and then and then you remember okay just being a little bit lazy here, but also conserving thread. We're 
almost getting to the fun bit where we get to put it all together. Another thing I discovered, um, again, surprisingly late, is that there's this little thing right here. It's It's got a tiny little blade inside of it, and you can just cut your thread like that. I mean, more modern digital machines have like an automatic thread cutter, and it just makes a little whoosh, and it cuts your thread for you. But not this one. All right. So totally different from dog feeding. Yes. Feed dogs and feeding dogs different. All right. So I have my two back pieces. One, two, and my one front piece. That's not it. This is not a square. Where's my front piece? That's not it either. You all saw me cut it, so we know. Okay, here it is. This is a square, see, 20 by 20. So what I'm gonna do is put them together. And um, you'll hear when people talk about sewing, um, when you're putting things together, they say right sides together, you know? So the side with the printing is the right side. Um, it's not right left, but kind of correct. This is interesting. Well, anyway, we're going to have, it doesn't matter. Um, you, oh, no, thank goodness I didn't cut the that side. So I'm going to put right sides together and line it up. And I'm just going to, I'm going to pin around just so everything stays in place. You can never have too many pins. Um, I've discovered like there's difference in quality in pins. Um, so if you're, if you're buying pins, often you want to look for ones that have what are called glass heads. Honestly, I can't tell the difference looking at them. The difference will come is like when you've got something pinned and you go to iron it, do you melt the pin head or do you not melt the pin head? So, um, the glass ones, obviously, unless you have a really crazy iron, um, won't melt, but you'll melt the plastic pin head. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, the, the finer the pin needle, um, the less damage it'll do to the fabric as you push it in and out of your fabric. And in a fabric like this, this is a really wide weave. I'm not, I'm not super worried about damaging it. But if you're working with like a silk or a nylon or something, you really could um, pull a thread pretty easily or a, a hole would show up pretty obviously. So slimmer pins, better in that case. Um, I'm just trying to think here. On the last one I did, it didn't matter which way the overlap went, but in this case, because I am planning on doing buttons, I want the side that has my interfacing, and I can tell because it's stiffer, I want that to be on the outside because that's where the button hole will be. So I'm going to make sure that it is underneath the other piece. This has a much more, this is just going to be comical. It'll be fine, but a much more significant overlap than my last one. I won't even be able to do buttons on this. I really should have, but I won't need to do buttons is the other thing because the overlap will be very generous. All right, live and learn. So someone told me something interesting recently. I'm not, I didn't research it or I didn't like, yeah, I haven't figured it out fully, but these like universal tomato pin cushion holders, um, the, it has the, it has the tomato for the pins and then this strawberry thing that hangs off on top. 
and um and this feels different like it's sandy inside whereas this is like cottony inside um so someone told me and i like i said i have yet to confirm it like this is filled with maybe a kind of a graphite powder for sharpening your pins i'm not sure how you do it like do you put your pin in and twist it does that sharpen the pin head anyway um or the pin point anyway if anyone wants to google it and confirm but anyway i am pinning around the edges What you can't see here, but I can, is my seven-year-old raiding the refrigerator. She's snooping, and look at what little does she know, I cleaned out the refrigerator. There's nothing in there except a giant bag of kale and an unusual amount of hummus. All right, Collins found how to sharpen pins. I'll read that later. Okay, now this is going to be super fast. The end of it is just, it's going to come together so quickly, you won't even believe it. Sewing, you think, is like time in front of the sewing machine. It's really the time measuring and cutting. Um, all right. So I have not done this cleverly, the way I pinned it. If I put my pins in the other way, I put them this way, I'll pull them out as I come to them. But a lot of people will actually just sew over the pins. And like one time in a thousand or more, like your needle will hit the pin and either bend your pin or break your needle. Um, but it's... It, you know, sometimes it's just worth the risk. Uh, but anyway, I've put these in backwards, so I'm gonna actually pull them out as I go along. Yeah, I don't think I don't think she's gonna go for the kale. All right, so we're back at the machine, and I'm gonna adjust my needle position. I'm gonna kind of have a pretty generous seam allowance here. And I'm just going to go all the way around. I'm going to back stitch. I'm going to have my pin cushion nearby so I can pull out and put them in. Nobody in the house is happy when they find a stray pin. So it's good to make sure you're putting your pins in the proper place. I also have, it's not honestly as great as I was hoping it would be. I have like one of these magnetic dishes to hold pins, but... Yeah, I like the pin cushion better. Let's go all the way around. Inevitably, you'll find kind of um, unevenness in your fabric, and you can usually work it out. It might wind up like in a tiny pleat or a pucker somewhere along the way, but nobody will ever notice. This fabric is is wavy too. It like wants to wants to move. It's pretty though. Ten years ago I never would have chosen this. something so colorful. All right. Pull as you go. Sewing over the pins against makerspace guidelines. Yes. Don't do it with someone else's sewing machine. I have a lot of bent pins as a result. All right, so I, um, you see I left my needle down and just rotated the fabric. Again, it just saves time, energy, and thread. Every now and again, I, I, I just 
am paranoid, I'll like do a back stitch. Um, and where the overlap happens, there's going to be a lot of strain on the fabric as you pull that cape, that envelope open and closed. So I'm just going to back stitch at the overlap. Oh, I dropped a pin. Ah, found it though. I have a dog that will eat everything he finds on the floor. Nobody needs a pin. Not so fun story. This dog ate an entire corn cob recently in two bites. Corn cobs are undigestible by dogs. I mean, I can't imagine an animal that can digest I and mean, maybe a cow. Can a cow? down, turn it 90 degrees. The corn cob had consequences. I mean, it was, um, for I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, the consequences were largely financial. He had a couple of visits to the emergency vet. It like all happened so fast. I just, I, like, I never thought like we had to get it away. From, I mean, I knew we had to get it away from him, but I thought I had like, I don't know, 30 seconds. I didn't, I didn't have 30 seconds. He just swallowed it. Because he knew we were coming after it. He was like, de he was determined. So he just, he swallowed, he just, one big gulp. Stitching again at the corner where it needs just a little, maybe a little extra strength. This is like, I find this part really, hippos might, yeah. I wonder like if, I mean, they have huge mouths, right? That They could eat a bushel of corn they, and they have huge teeth. So I can feel I'm going over the spot where it overlaps. I'm going to back stitch to provide some extra strength. Ooh, I have a little long thread here. Snip. I'm going to get that one too. So many scissors. Scissors. Scissors have, um, they're like socks in my house. They just disappear. And then reappear, but... But I definitely, like, cannot lay my hands on a pair of scissors at any given moment. Scissors are like catnip for kids. Okay, so I've sewn all around the edges. Swizzers, swizzers, swizzers. They have legs of their own. Okay, so we're almost done here. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a little snip on the corners. I'm, here's where contrasting thread would have helped, but um, it'll make them kind of fold a little better. Uh, oh, the dog is so sad. Can you hear him crying? Yes. Just kind of cut off the corners. Um, and I'm not going to do it now because honestly nobody needs to sit around and watch this. But what I did on my other pillowcase, and I may do later on this one, is um, 
run outside outside you can't see it. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw on um, so here's where my stitch line is what I will probably do later is go around again and sew a zigzag stitch outside it like that um, and what that will do is just keep keep the inside seam from fraying um, depending on how much abuse this pillowcase takes in its life um, this fat you know the tails could kind of come off um, so and then eventually you know the pillowcase would digest itself so all right so we turn it turn it inside in outside out and we've got that and I'm gonna get my pillow form Yeah, this, this more generous overlap works a lot better. So, um, yeah, you can't, there's no, there's no bursting out. But yeah, I'm, oh, and look at that. It's all it's kind of coincidence. I didn't plan for it, but the bird is dead center. No need for buttons. Yeah, so take a nap. I don't know. But this was super simple. I mean, how long, we've been here an hour and 15 minutes and it went from like truly beginning to end, cutting the fabric to sewing it. Um, so yeah, it's like a super fast, fast thing. And like you could, I mean, given how easy it is and how relatively inexpensive, um, you could kind of have seasonal pillows. This is a good spring pillow. Are there any questions? Well, maybe next time I'll figure out buttons. And uh, we'll do that. Oh, goodness. There goes the dog. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, and I, uh, I'll see you all again. Bye.